Today is absolutely going to be such a beautiful chat with my new friend, Arlene Steputat from, I met Arlene only just recently through um, my spiritual psychology program. And we were in one of the um, practice groups together. And I instantly knew that I wanted um, Arlene as a guest on my podcast because she has such a interesting um story and life and I just want to find out all about that so welcome Arlene to the Happiness Hive podcast how are you? I'm good and I'm um uh, for me just for your viewers being in America it's still Sunday yes <laughs> so, you know uh, that that whole time thing is is always interesting yes we're a day I mean, ahead we're a day yeah, ahead we're coming ahead. to you from the future we're coming for, to you from the future so we're about yeah, to America kind of fun. Yeah, whereabouts are you in America? I live in Santa Barbara, California, which is about 90 miles north of Los Angeles. It's often called uh, the American Riviera because it's a Mediterranean climate and it's kind of ocean and mountains and uh, kind of the rich and famous. There was a soap opera years ago about Santa Barbara and right next door, the very next town over, just like 10 miles away is um, Oprah Winfrey lives there and she Ooh. enticed Megan and Prince Harry to live here. And my invitation for high tea has gotten lost in the mail. Oh, so I was going to ask if you. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know what's happened. I have to check with the post to see why I haven't been invited. Why you yet. haven't been invited. Do you bump into them? Do you see them around? Do you see Oprah I around? have not, but they have been sighted around town. And actually there is a polo club Um one other city down, not too far away. It's, you know, little villages kind of nestled together. And and actually, Harry had played polo here before. Um, and, of course, you know, Megan being from Hollywood, I'm sure she had been to Santa Barbara because yeah. we're only 90 miles away. It's a two-hour drive. So commuting, so commuting distance. They could commute so, to Los yeah. Angeles. Many people do commute. We have lots of Hollywood people here uh, in this, mm. you know, area. So it's oh. kind of fun. That's fun. That's fun. Yet. Yeah. <laughs> um, have you always lived in Santa Barbara? I have not. I grew up uh, on the other coast of America, on the East Coast, and was born in a, a little state. You know, we have 50, a little state yeah. called New Jersey, which was right next to New York State and right next to New York City. I grew up about 15 miles from New York City in a very small town. But my mom had uh, been raised in New York City. So I actually grew up going into Manhattan uh, from the time I was a, a young girl. So I actually saw my first Broadway show when I was six. Oh, my gosh. That is just such a bucket list um, for me. That we, we, I've been to America, um, to the West Coast, um, and I've been to Hawaii, but the East Coast is definitely a bucket list for me and Broadway, oh, my goodness, first one at six. Um, actually, I think my first, mine's certainly not Broadway in Australia, but um, my, what was the first show that you saw? Do you remember? It, it's a show people wouldn't know. is called Destry Rides Again. Oh. But during high school, because we were so close, um, we would have field trips where in the morning they would take us to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And then on a Wednesday afternoon, we'd see a matinee. So I saw, you know, Man of La Mancha and Les Miserables and just oh. all the Broadway shows. And it was a school day. Wow. Oh, my gosh. So jealous. My, my first that one was, was a great life. Yeah. My first one was Jesus Christ Superstar. Uh-huh. I don't I, I love that one too. Yeah, yeah, I love that. So what did you do growing up there? What was growing up like like for you? Um, well, I'm an only child. My parents uh, were married 11 years before my mom got pregnant just because they couldn't. Yeah. And so I, was, I came in as a very loved child, a wanted child, yes. and um, had a charmed childhood, I would say, in a small village, you know, small town. Um, and... Then my uh, dad died when I was quite young. Yeah. So he died very suddenly. And I know from, from you that yes. you had yes. loss early. Yes. And so that changes everything. Yeah, it sure does. Um, and for any of your other listeners, you know, having a death of a parent. Um, How old were you? Death, How old were you? 
I was 11 years old. Mm. My dad died four days before my 12th birthday and 20 days before Christmas. Oh, bloody hell. Mine was, my mum died the day before my 12th birthday. So we're the yeah. members of that same club. Yeah. Of being a parent. And yeah. um, while I think I'm probably older than you, um, what's true is that people had no idea how to deal with children in grief. Oh. And so because it was the holidays, because it was my birthday, people just gave me gifts. Yeah. And my mother was in shock. It was quite a sudden death. Her mother lived with us, my grandmother. So anyway, um, so what I will say is that I grew up very quickly. Yeah. I started working when I was 12. And at the same time, particularly in high school, I also wanted to do everything. So I was like in the high school band and in the drama club and I worked 20 hours a week and I was a straight A student and I took care of my grandmother. You know, wow. I did all of those things because I wanted to, I wanted to have a, a teenage life and I had these adult responsibilities. Yes. So yeah, I did. I, that's interesting. Um, wanting to do it all and being a straight A student. I was reading something the other day, Arlene, that because I wasn't a straight A student. I, I, I was up until when mum passed away. And then I was reading something the other day that was saying that um, grief and the, the, the trauma of losing someone is the equivalent, um, and, and please don't quote me on this, but ha like having a brain injury for some people and that that grieving brain um, affects us physiologically. And looking back on that, I can see that's absolutely what happened for me. It's almost like, it's not that I couldn't read, but it was just a real struggle to, um, to study. So it sounds like your journey was, you know, being a straight A student, doing lots, wanting to be involved. Um, I wanted to be a good girl and make life easy for my mother. Yes. So I did everything I could to not get in the way, to yes. not um, cause any trouble, to she had enough to deal with. Yes. And so yeah. uh, and also, uh, I, you know, in high school, I wanted to go to college and I knew we didn't have money. Yes. So then it was like, well, if I get good grades, maybe I can get a scholarship. So yeah. it, I was very driven to. Yeah. That's cool. To be good. Yeah, yeah. And did you go to college? What did you study in college? I did. I uh, and and that's an interesting thing too. I I went to a college that was local um, because I didn't realize my mother was going to get remarried. And as an only child, I was really her caregiver too. If, if she got sick, anyway. So what I studied was again my age at the time. Um, Women were primarily geared towards school teacher, yes, secretary, yes. or nurse. <laughs> yes. So nursing was not for me. No. My mother's older sister had been a very successful uh, executive secretary and it ended up marrying the bank president. And she saw no reason why I should want to go to college. Oh, so she was yeah. very strongly against it. But to my mother's credit, she wanted me to get an education. And so I became a teacher and I studied teaching and English as my primary um, area with drama oh, lovely. as a secondary thing. And then um, remedial reading was just coming into its own where people understood. Yes. So I took that as a teaching credential as well. And I was able to get a teaching job as a remedial reading teacher when I first started. And did you stay teacher for, was that your career? As a teacher, did you? Uh, well, yes and no. Yeah. Um, my first year, so when I was doing a pra practicum uh, as, a, as a student, I was uh, in an alternative high school where it was a much freer kind yes. of environment. And I really liked that. Then I got my first teaching job and it was very strict and I was very naive. I didn't know how to play politics. I was hired for maternity. It was a whole bunch yeah, of things. Yeah. Um, so I had a bad experience after that first year, and I decided I wouldn't go back to public schools, you know, the state-run yeah, sure. schools. Yeah. Uh, I ended up working. I had, in college, worked on a hotline. I'd always been interested in psychology. And so 
through my career, I, I worked as a teacher in a facility for people who had psychiatric uh, illnesses, but were out released from facilities and, and, and home. So I, t- I taught there. And then I ended up teaching in an alternative high school in uh, inner city, Newark, New Jersey, where kids had flunked out of the private, the public school system, maybe were in trouble with the law, maybe had gotten pregnant, you know, whatever, and, and chose to go to this school, which was called Independence High School. And so I taught there for a number of years. And then I went on, I got more interested in people's lives. So I went on to work with underserved youth in lots of ways. So I ran group homes and all that. So, but I, my master's is in community education and family education. And I would say I still do that. Oh, that, yes. Do you know, there's so many parallels to, um, what you're talking about, like it's not exactly my journey, but the, there are certainly parallels there as well. I studied adult and community education um, that I never thought I would. That was something that just came about when I started working, a job opportunity opened up. Um, my husband worked, he's a teacher. He's an um, industrial art, so does woodwork and metalwork and design. Um, but there was a period of time that he worked in a um a school for underprivileged kids and he set, helped set up their young mums program. So for girls that had babies young, he helped to set up that program um, as well and working with some of the underprivileged kids. So it's, yeah, lovely. He's working with kids with disabilities at the moment, um, which is just beautiful to see. So what? But I want to yeah. say something, yeah. uh, if I may. Yes, please. When I was 10, um, there was a To Sir With Love Was Out, if people yes. haven't seen that with Sydney Poitier. And there was another book out called Up the Down Staircase about inner cities. And when I was 10 years old, and of course, there were rioting riots in the United States. And I wasn't, I was, for one of those riots, my home was three miles away. Uh, Even though my community was not integrated, yes. it was very close. Yes. Anyway, all that to say that when I was 10, I got a very clear um, message that I was supposed to teach in inner city. Wow. I was 10 years old. And I said, wow. someday I'm going to do that. And I did. Wow. Isn't that, how did that play out for you? So when you were 10, you had this message. Did you just, was that in the back of your mind that, or did you, or was it in the front of your mind? Well, I think, I think it was, kind of in the back, but I knew that the first step to teach anywhere was to become a teacher. So that's what I pursued. So when my aunt was saying, no, you should be a secretary. I'm like, no, I'm going to be a teacher. So that was step one. And, um, and then, you know, things just evolved as they should, you know, if I had stayed in the public school that I was in, that never would have happened. That was more of a middle-class community. So I've really come to understand that um, everything works in a purpose and that I just have to trust the timing of stuff. And so, uh, yeah, so I taught inner city for four or five years easily. Yeah. Yeah. And it is, isn't it, um, Arlene, about being open to opportunities, trusting that the, for me, it's a balance of creating opportunities, but also being open to opportunities that come forward for us as well yeah yeah and uh you know and I I have to say um I had another interesting opportunity so the summer before I was going to college I was at the beach and I met a girl who was a cheerleader in high school and was a couple years ahead of me and she said oh what are you going to study and she was at the same university and I told her I'm going to do English and she said well listen as an English major, all the teachers teach mythology and literature. You have to take it, but there's only one teacher you should take it with. And that's Dr. Barrett. Like, don't take it from anybody else. And she said, you're going to work as hard as you can, but she will change your life. And I heard her and I took that class and she was right because that woman taught mythology as the evolution of human consciousness. And so I got exposed to things I had never heard of in my life at 19. Wow. Isn't that good that that person came into your life to let you know that message? 
Well, she was a messenger. Yeah, and you, you know, I mean, this was we, we met at a beach far from both of our homes. We were probably yeah. fifty miles away. So yeah, but I listened, and I think that's the other thing. Yes. Sometimes you get the messages, but you yes. have to listen. Yes. Yeah. So how did that change your life then? The things that you're exposed to at nineteen. Well, it really, you know, I have to say, when you ask me how I I was raised, my parents were both um, faith-filled people. Yes. My mother had been raised Catholic, did not work for her. My father had been raised Lutheran. At the time they got married, you know, they couldn't get married in the Catholic. I mean, there's all these roles. And so they decided when I was born to raise me in a different church that neither one of them had been involved in which was a Methodist church. And it was a very loving ex- yeah. you know, experience. And I went to Sunday school and I learned all these different things. And I would say by the time I was 17, and I used to sing in the choir, which was the only way I really felt the connection was through the music. But I heard these people who had great faith and I wanted it, but I didn't know how to get it. Yeah. And I wasn't getting it in the church, except when I sang, which is why I sang for all those years. Um, So in answer to your question, that class did change my life because she opened up a whole world of thoughts and, you know, Jungian archetypes and and mythology and understanding all of that. And we read Hero with a Thousand Faces before Bill Moyers was a name, you know, and so what it did was uh, it just kind of woke me up like, oh, my gosh, there's so much more. Yeah. And so I kind of followed wherever she guided me as a, a spiritual director, you know. Yeah. So she I remember Pierre Vallot, who was the head of the Sufi movement, did a huge thing in New York City at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. Well, I was. 15 miles away, I could go to something like that and see whirling dervish and, you know, just kind of you're 19 years old. And it's wow. like, oh my gosh. So it changed everything yeah. in a very good yeah. way. Yeah. I, I, for me, a similar journey was through my studies, um, th- studying psychology that I got, you know, exposed to a whole lot of just things um, that I would not ordinarily have um, been exposed to. So let's fast forward some years. So, so growing up, um, what, what are you doing now? So tell us about the end of life doula. I know we're kind of doing a very, you yeah. know, we're cutting out a whole lot of chunk, but I would love it for our viewers because um, what, what is the, an end of life doula, Arlene? So, um, you know, the truth is, and I, at the risk of sounding somewhat sexist, but women have always been the ones to take care of the sick and the dying mm-hmm. as well as welcome in the children. It's just yeah. always been our domain. And um, I would say maybe 30 years ago, women were changing the way birth was done. And so midwives and birthing doulas came to the fore. And uh, so an end of life doula, there's many similarities between the coming into life and leaving life in a reverse process. It's unpredictable. You need a lot of nurturing, all that stuff. And so an end of life doula, is a non-medical person, so we don't do anything medical, that helps prepare the person and their family for the process. And it can start with a perfectly healthy person that hasn't, for instance, done in America, we call it an advanced healthcare directive. Like, do you want to be resuscitated? That kind of thing. I think ours is the same. I think ours is. Yeah. So it's having that conversation. Well, do you want to be cremated? Do you want to die? And I'm a big advocate of if you're over 18, you need to start thinking about those things because it's not just people, yeah. older people that die, it's everybody. And it's also part of it is putting death back in its rightful place as a cycle of life. Yeah. You know, it's been so medicalized in our country and probably yours yes, as well. Yes, yes. You know, where death is the enemy. So, um, so doulas help people befriend death. And then as people get, uh, into the dying process, we do all kinds of things to support the family and the person. Um, And it can be everything from sitting vigil in their dying days. I'm working with a family right now where I'm supporting the wife, her husband's dying of brain cancer, 
but I'm also helping her put together his ceremony and oh, what lovely. she wants and working with what he wants and just, and listening to her about yeah. her life. And, you know, so it's a beautiful opportunity. And then on the other side, when someone actually passes, we can do ritual, help people do ritual washing of the body or blessing the body. And then we can, you know, do ceremony there too. Yes. So it's yeah. a beautiful opportunity. And some people do it as a profession. And I am lucky enough, I've been in death and dying field for a very long time. I work with five other women and in our community, we are able to offer it as a loving service. Yeah, that's beautiful. When we talked about that, that's absolutely beautiful. So a loving service means that people don't, uh, don't need to pay for that service. That right. you're able to offer that for them. Right. Um, so is that part of a community that you, is it an organized community that does that or? A, a... Well, it's a, we, I organize it with my six women. I, I yeah. started the doula and I, I do want to say to your, to your um, listeners yeah. too, that there are uh, end of life doulas who get paid and should yes. get paid. Yes. I'm yes. just like, it is a profession and there's lots of ways doulas are integrated working in hospital hospitals and hospices. I'm in our community. This is, we're a small community and ooh, that's how we're doing it here. Yes. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yes. I'm, I'm aware that there are, um, people that do that, that that is a profession like it is a, a business for and people absolutely yeah yeah and it's becoming more and more of an awareness as we are growing and changing yes. our attitudes about death and dying and i have to say that covid put death in our face in a way that nothing else had so um doulas help pick up a lot of the gap of the yes. trauma of what happened yes. to people yes and I, I remember when we were chatting arlene so you um people can find you at dying in grace it's that dyinggrace.com yeah and there is actually a tab about end of life doulas that would explain more yeah. in depth the different roles that doulas yes do. yes yeah. so so dying in grace and when I first met Arlene she said um I don't know if you recall this but it's also dying in grace is about living in grace it's a part of yes. the cycle and it's about helping people to um you know navigate that that journey um and like you said then it's not just about the people who are dying or at end of life but it's supporting their families as well and I think from my ex my, my um dad passed away last year and that my two brothers and I it was a it was a tough process you know he was unwell for quite some time he had moved into a nursing home and then the final stages were very sudden, like they were, you know, a week. Um, and it was that whole vigil and we sort of navigated that. But it would have been nice to have a um, somebody to lead us through, you know. But Dad did have his advanced care plan in place, which made it so much easier for us that we just enacted what he his wishes were. Um, so that made it... It made it so much easier for us. Yeah. Sorry, that's just yeah. my job. And I'm sorry for your loss because losing the second parent is tough. Sorry about that. We just had a dog barking in the background. So you were saying, yes, it is tough losing a second parent. Um, it is Because there's no buffer anymore. It's yes. you. And um, my mother died when I was 38. So I was kind of an orphan in the world and I wasn't married or anything. I had no brothers and sisters. I mean, it was quite an interesting experience and, um, but it was all part of the preparation so I could do what I do now. So you mentioned before that you, sorry, that's Boston in the background. I think, I'm um, sorry for the listeners. That's um, that there's probably a butterfly or something going past the window. Um, you mentioned before, Arlene, that you have spent a lot of time around death and dying. Um, tell me more about that. So how did you get into being an end-of-life doula? Well, it, it was an evolutionary process. So um, like you, my first experience of death came very suddenly when I was young. Um, then when I was um, 19, I went to uh, the UK as an exchange student for a semester, which was a, idyllic in my, in my experience and had a wonderful time. 
And uh, one of my uh, mates, British friends, new girlfriend, really tight, um, was unfortunately murdered. Like right the last week I was in school oh, and it no. became national, national news oh. in England. And uh, I was 3,000 miles away, well, 6,000 miles away from everyone. Um, and so having violence touch my life, that was something. And then not wanting to tell my family. So I had all yeah. that um, to deal with. And then, you know, as life went on, I had a period where I lost almost everyone in a very short time. And I also worked in New York city during the AIDS crisis. Yes. And I helped start a program for babies who were dying of AIDS. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. Because they were border babies. No one wanted to, they lived in hospitals. People were afraid to touch them and change their diapers. And and we just realized they needed to be loved before they died. So all this experience of death coming to me in, in rapid succession and everything, a suicide, a car crash, just a bunch of different oh. things. I kind of said, I need to start to befriend this. It's not going away. It's part of life. And so I started to first work with my own grief from way back. And, and the University of Santa Monica really helped me deal with it on levels that I didn't even know were inside of me. So, um, so then, uh, so I was in education until I came to California and then I started volunteering with a local hospice. And I think you would resonate with this. I heard on the radio, a new program, a hospice was doing, and it was called, I have a friend and they were recruiting mentors. And the mentors were for children who had lost a parent, but you could only be a mentor if you lost a parent when you were a child. And as soon as I heard that, I thought to myself, I must do this. I could have so used that. So that got me in the hospice world. and, and, And I've been involved with it ever since. I worked for the Alzheimer's Association for a while. That also is a one way journey. So, uh, So when doulas became more of a thing in hospices, I started to pursue it and uh, had a friend who ended up saying, well, I'll give you a free training. I I trained for this international group of of doulas. You're perfect. Why don't you just go through the training? And that's it. Wow. Well, do you know what? To me, that sounds like it's, that's your path and that you'd sort of, listened like you were saying before the opportunities you'd listened but following would it be a calling Arlene is it a calling oh uh, a doing end of life is definitely a calling and and if you talk to folks that work in hospice or oncology or something yes they say I I didn't choose it it chooses you yes yes you know um because it it takes well first off it you know in some of your listeners may already be cringing because just even talking about death is not a polite conversation. No, no, you know, so, so to work in it, um, it's really such a privilege. Yes. It is such a great honor to be at this and the Celtics say where the veil is thin, you know? So it's this, like the the worlds are very spirits, very present when babies come in, it's very magical and if you've ever been when people are taking their last breath, there's a there's a a gift in that if yes. you can see it, you know. So Actually, yeah, it's, it's definitely cool. when you when you say that my dad um volunteered as um w- with palliative care. So he mm-hmm. had done some some training, which sounds similar to what you're um probably not as much as what you've done but he would visit people in hospitals and just volunteer and just be there and sit with them and talk with them um I don't think he and did people more need that, that. Yes. they need that yes. and a lot of times because there's such an adverse reaction to sickness and death and people say I don't know what to say that they don't go yes and, yes. and it's when people really need to be heard the most what would your advice be for people who do have loved ones who are near you know at the end of life in in the final stages what would be some tips for them to navigate that food because for some people it is very confronting and what what do you have any pearls of wisdom 
Well, um, listen, like you said, just be there yeah, and listen. Uh, well, yeah. one is if you're a caregiver yes. for someone, to be sure that you also take care of yourself, yes. that you allow yourself yes. to have some respite, that you're also gentle with yourself, that you find moments of joy. Um, working yourself to exhaustion um, erodes the relationship. Yes. yes. So there's that. Um, to realize that. Um, to get to the loving that you share with that person. And if the person is passing and you don't have loving with them, it's a great opportunity to just um, forgive it anyway. Yes. To understand that they did whatever they did doing the best they could. Um, it's a, it's a beautiful time to um, celebrate yes. and remember and laugh. I mean, you, you know, um, one of the things we do as doulas is help people set up their vigils. Like, how would you like the room to be, yeah. you know? Nice. And I have a friend who's a doula and she said, I want a chocolate fondue. I want a bottle <laughs> of whiskey and I want yeah. people coming in and telling jokes, you know, it. I'm happy. I'm glad yeah. I'm, get, you know, yeah. so, but I, I would also say get support. If you're, if someone you love is, is dying please speak to other people. There's bereavement counselors, like get support for yourself yes. and cherish this time and um, don't get caught in the small stuff. Oh, I, would, I was talking to a girlfriend just yesterday about, um, about that getting small, caught in the small stuff. You know, there, there's bigger things at play there. Well, and the thing is that um, there's a term that we have learned, you and I, in our in our course of study, uh, and I love it. And I, and that's allowing the person who's dying the dignity of their process. Absolutely, their process. Absolutely. It's their dying. It doesn't have to look the way I think it should. And especially as a doula, I don't know how it's supposed to go. Yeah. I don't know what the family's supposed to do. Yeah. I, I have to just surrender to be used and yeah. support. Yeah. And I think it's also um, useful, and this is what you're, you're talking about, that you do in your, your practice, but for people to think about those things in advance because it's very stressful to have those conversations in the present, you know, when people are near the end of life. Um can, can I ask you, Arlene, how early do doulas get involved in that end of life? Is it, is it, is it when people have got weeks to live or days or years? Like what's the, I, I know there's no normal around that, but how does that work? Um, so w when do I get, when do doulas Yeah, when do the doula in? get involved? Yeah. Um, well, it's, it's interesting. I, I think we get involved. Uh, most of the cases that I have gotten involved with either have come by referral from a hospice yeah. or a referral from someone who knows of my work and talks to a family and said, hey, we know this, these people that could come yeah. help. So um, it's usually at least when there is a serious illness or perhaps a diagnosis. Yeah, sure. uh, but it, it, it often is as it's taking its course. So I often get involved when people are already enrolled in hospice. Yes, yes. And in America, um, you're eligible for hospice when it looks like you might have six months or less to yes. live. Yeah. So, um, so that gives you a time frame. That being said, you know, people live beyond that, you yes. know, they live yes. longer than that. But, um, and it depends. Uh, I've worked with a family I did a lot of work with a woman whose whose husband was much older than she is. So he's like 95 and she's 70 or something. Yeah. And um, but they got everything in place. He's still chugging along and she'll call me when something changes. Yeah, nice. Right. Yeah. Now. So it was just the pre preparing yes. and the conversation. So it really it's yeah. case by case. Yeah, that's cool. That's really good. That's really good to know. Um, and we do have um end of life doulas in Australia. We certainly have birthing doulas. Um, we do have end of life and they're varying. Um, I think the ones that I'm familiar with, it is a paid service. 
Um, but um, yeah, it's possible. And it should be. I yet. mean, yes. I'm just lucky yeah. enough to not have to do that. Yeah, but that's lovely. So let me. Um, so that sounds like it's a calling for you. What are some things that fill your cup? And that's probably part of what fills your cup is that, that the honour of being with people at the end of life. But what are some other things in your life that that kind of spark joy for you? Well, I have to say that from the time I was a, a little girl, being of service is really, um, being of service to others has always been a, uh, a linchpin in my life to the point where I actually ran volunteer programs for other people to help them be of service. Yes. So that brings a great amount of joy to me being of service um, in, in ways that are meaningful to me. Um, my animal animals have always brought me great joy. Um, we I've always had animals. We have two dogs and a cat right now, but we have a little menagerie. We, we feed, we feed the wild critters outside so we see bunnies and skunks and raccoon you know so there's yes. that yes. I recently went to a donkey sanctuary where they were saving donkeys yes. so anything with animals brings yes. me great joy Same. Same. Uh, yeah. nature brings me great joy yeah. um, living Santa Barbara is a gorgeous place and so the beauty of the ocean and the mountains and the plants and yes. sunsets that kind of stuff yeah. um I am blessed to have a, a, an amazing marriage yeah. and I have grandchildren and uh, um, my husband had sons. So I'm a mother, a um, laborless grandma, which I highly recommend. I didn't have to birth anybody, but I still get to be a grandmother. That's nice. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It just kind of worked out that way. Yeah. Um, so, you know, my friends bring me joy. Yeah. Um, just... Um, Watching people grow, you know, yes. we met because of our studies, yeah. but, but what being in a place where I watch people go from this to this, yeah. you know, that, that is just magic. That's magic. Watch, I love, yes. I love it's that. It's just, it, I can't get enough of it. I, I, and I've been doing that for 26 years or something. Yeah. So. And that's a yes. And, we, you know, when you started out and talking about the, the teaching and from a 10 year old, you knew that you were going to be teaching in a certain area. So that t teaching is about helping people to develop and grow um, and just to, to be their best. That certainly is um, sparks my joy as well. Um, do you have daily practices that you I do? Um, yeah. What a, I do like have a lot of daily from? practices. Um, well, one is spending quiet time every day, um, just internal. Um, I, I'm in a, a, a church that uh, call, calls it spiritual exercises. So it's like an yes. internal chanting. So spending time with that, um, spending time reading sacred literature. Um, and also uh, praying for people. Um, we do a thing called calling in the light. So sending good intentions and there's a, a lot of um, things that are sort of in, so integrated into my life at yes. this point that um, they're just second nature. Um, and then in our school, there are also other practices that we've learned that help us. So uh, when I go to bed, I say a prayer of gratitude. I do a gratitude journal and then I set a bedtime intention for more guidance to yes. what am I supposed yes. to do yes. when I wake up? It's my first prayer is, you know, use me here. I am. Thank you. What do you want me to do today? So yeah. kind that's of, lovely. yeah, that's lovely. The bookends, yeah. you know? Yes. yes. I am um, my, my practice um, uh, similar in, in the morning. I have sort of setting intentions and, um, and gratitude and then the end of the day is um, reflecting on the day and what I've been grateful for and then what 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 I would like assistance with for the the following days as well yeah and and one practice that I think is key and it's it's probably a harder one is when I find myself in upset yes. you know in the course yeah, yeah. of the day when something yes. doesn't work out the way I think it should is taking the time to see what that experience has to teach me yes and uh, to heal from the part of me that's judging that it didn't go the way I thought it should, yes. or you didn't do what I thought you should do to see what I can glean 
and heal inside of me. And so that's a practice that I apply when it shows up. Yeah. I, yes. I was just thinking about that as you were saying it. For me, yes, it's when it shows up. It's like, oh, what's going on here? Why, why am I yeah. reacting when I'm the way that I'm reacting? When I'm out of sorts, what's that bringing up for me? Yeah. Where's that coming from? Is it, you know, an old story, an old pattern, or is it actually something that still needs some attention and healing? But the first place I go to is that's interesting. Why is that doing that? Why, why am I reacting that way? Um, and sometimes that's all I need to do. Sometimes yeah. I just go, I just get the insight going, oh, okay. Other times it's just like, why am I responding that right. way? Like that person, right. you know, something, this situation, I feel really triggered by that. And, and what I've changed, Arlene, is I've stopped saying the situation has triggered me or the person has triggered me to I have been triggered by wow. that situation or I have been triggered by the person. So I'm taking ownership because it's not about you. It's not about the person that whatever right. they've done. It's about, oh, how am I responding to that? Why am right. I being triggered the way that I'm being triggered? So that's a change in my, d just how I approach those situations. But that's a big change. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like it's, uh, you know, it, that's a huge shift because yeah. it, it, it's, it, like you said, it's taking responsibility. Yes. And those practices that we're both talking about, you know, they are not easy ones to cultivate, no. <laughs> you know, um, and and so lots of people do morning prayer and evening yes. prayer, but there's like, it's kind of what you do in the middle there in the yes. course of your day that is. Yeah. So I, I would say, you know, the practice that I work with daily is to just be consciously loving. Yes. 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 Loving towards yourself, loving towards others and not yeah. just other people, but you, you've talked about other you know, animals um, and, and nature as well. It's just, well, it's just kind of accepting, yes. accepting what is. I'm not yeah. happy that it's 110 degrees right now, but that's it, being upset about it being hot is not going to change it. So I might as well just cooperate with it. <laughs> Drink Actually, some Arlene water. was, yes, Arlene was saying at the beginning of the chat. So it's 110 Fahrenheit. Um, for those here in Australia, that's about 43, 44 degrees. So that's hot. And it's, um, you normally don't get those. Hot oh, days, it's record breaking here. Yes. It's crazy. Yeah. We could go down a whole different. Nope. <laughs> but we won't. <laughs> we won't do yeah, that. Yeah, not, not this talk. Uh, no. Arlene, what's next for you? What's next? Well, you know, one of the things I have this practice of doing is um, following guidance and not knowing why. <laughs> so I got. Um, very strong guidance to take a course in the local community college in journalism. So I have enrolled and I have had my third class in journal. I've taken three classes in journalism. Awesome. So I am not quite sure why I'm taking this class. I'm not sure if it's to be on the campus. I'm certainly older than the instructor, much less the other students. <laughs> I'm, I, I want to learn. I mean, I like yeah. to learn and see what that is, but I have a sense that um, something else is going to be revealed during the course of the semester. That's going to say to me, Oh, that's why I did yes. that. Yeah. That's interesting. And just before we do end, there was another example of that where you said you, you became a chaplain with the local fire service, didn't you? And that was one yes. of those, you weren't quite, d tell me quickly about how did that come about? Well, it was during COVID. I was um, trying to dispose of some uh, prescriptions and I went to the local sheriff's office, which had a drop box and it was COVID. No one was really around. Another car pulled up. It was someone I knew who was a chaplain. We're chit-chatting and um, I felt as if I was in a cartoon and spirit filled in the bubble. And I said to this person, how do you become a chaplain? And he went, oh, I would love it if you became a chaplain. Oh. <laughs> it was not on my radar screen at all. 
it was from someplace else, but I followed through and I became a chaplain with the fire department. And one of my roles is to comfort people who have recently, I mean, like immediately lost someone, you know, my son just overdosed and they call in the chaplain. So it made no sense to me. I had no idea what the job was. I just followed suit. And, and I'm also seeing ways that I'm to improve the program. Yes. Too. Yes. And, you know, that gets back to just trusting um, and accepting and following and letting it unfold how it just sometimes you don't know the reasoning for it until down the track. So it'll be interesting with the journalism. What? Um, yeah, well, I think there's a, a some kind of quote. It's like, um, take the leap and the net will appear. Yes, yes. Yeah. And so... Yeah. I, I've learned through my life at this point, it, I mean, even coming when moving to California, it made no sense. It was just like move. So it's like, okay. Wow. So I've been kind of doing that. And I would really invite your listeners to trust that message. Yes. I love it. Without trying to understand it, just kind of lean in, see just what lean happens. And allow, allow. Yeah. Arlene, just um, quickly, where can people find you again? Um. So dyingingrace.com is the website. Um, The email is simply Arlene, A-R-L-E-N-E, at dyingingrace.com. Please, all questions, whatever. That would be lovely. Love to hear from you. I'm happy to be international. (laughs) Find a doula in your community too. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, um, Arlene, for that. I really appreciate your time and hugs and happiness to you. Yeah, thanks so much, Catherine. This is lovely. Look forward to seeing you again in class. Yes. So here we are again for some added bonus. And what I wanted to ask um, Arlene, so in the the podcast chat, we sort of moved from, um, you're talking about being on the East Coast, and then I kind of cut that short a little bit. Tell me, how did you move from East Coast to West Coast? What was that trajectory? Uh, well, it was it was kind of interesting. I had gone through um, some very painful times in my life, a lot of experiences, and then had done some, um, some personal work yes. on myself. And I was with a, a group of people um, who we were walking uh, in New York City and um, a number of these people were planning to move to Los Angeles and I had no interest in Los Angeles whatsoever. Still don't, no offense. Um, so I got separated with the traffic light. I tied my shoe or something and they had been talking about going to California and I, it's kind of like the field of dreams movie. If you've yeah, seen that, yeah, I yeah, got yeah. this voice that said, move to California. And I was like, what? And I crossed the street and one of the, my friends said, you look really odd. What's wrong? And I said, well, I just got this message that I should move to California. And he said, well, come with us to Los Angeles. I said, I'm not supposed to go to Los Angeles. And he said, well, where are you supposed to go? And I said, I really don't know, but it's where the ocean and the mountains come together. And he said, well, that sounds like Santa Barbara. You should go. That, that sounds, I said, well, I don't know. I've never been to Santa Barbara. Wow. Three weeks later, I came out to Santa Barbara just to see it and do some other spiritual things. And um, it made no sense. I had a very good job. I had friends. I was doing very well. And I made up my mind that I was going to move to to Santa Barbara. And so I did it with a plan. And uh, in the middle of that, I became a minister. I'm an ordained minister. And I told my mother I was going to move to California. And I was very hesitant about telling her that because it's 3,000 miles away. It's not. And instead, I had this most amazing heartfelt conversation with my mother that I have ever had in my life. And I got ordained. I came home. I had a phone chat with her. And she said, come over for dinner. And uh, tell me all about it. I said, okay. The next day I was at work and I got a phone call and my mother had passed away. She died quite suddenly. Wow. So that conversation I had with her was my last conversation with her. But it, 
it was clean. I had no regrets. Mm -hmm. I got her blessing. And so the very first thing I did as a minister was my mother's funeral. Oh, gosh, Arlene. And then um, after I got things settled, I gave notice at my job and I moved to Santa Barbara. Uh, I didn't really know anyone. I didn't really have a place to stay exactly. I certainly didn't have a job. Uh, I had one friend that I knew and people thought I was crazy. And I said, no, I need to do this. If it doesn't work out, I can always go back to New York, but I don't want to pay the price for the rest of my life of wondering what would have happened. Regret. If I had what, done what that. If, yeah. And I have to say, Catherine, my, my whole life became a dream and I found my husband. And so, um, yeah, so I'm a big believer in take the leap, even if it doesn't make sense. And even if people are telling you you're crazy. Yeah. Do you know what I hear? And this was through our earlier chat as well, but that trust and yeah. really trusting and allowing that to unfold because I, I bet a lot of people would go themselves, oh, that's crazy. Why would I go to Santa Barbara? Like I've got nothing there. Why would I? And needing to have a like know what the destination is going to be. But I've heard from you, the pattern, Arlene, is very much about following, like listening to the intuition, listening to the guidance um, and kind of acting on it without knowing, like you're not being reckless. You said you had a plan to go out there, but you're not being reckless, but you're kind yeah. of going, I'm going to follow this and just um you know Catherine something just came to me and I think it's pertinent and 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 maybe you, you have this too when my father died we didn't know what was going to happen next I mean we had no money I mean it was really and my mother said to me we will be taken care of God's going to take I don't know how it's going to work but it's going to be okay and that little 11 year old girl believed that and I think, and I never put this together until just now, but I think that part of me is like, I'm going to be okay. I, can you just hang on? I'm just going to pause this for two secs. The dog's sure. just going crazy. I'll be back in. Sorry, Boston was just being crazy at the front door. Um, so you were saying that you're, you're going to be, it will be okay. Your mom said to you you will be okay. Is that we will be okay. That, be okay. that we will be taken care of. And to tr so, I mean, I guess it was her trust. Yes. And her faith in, in trusting that was an example in the face of the biggest unknown of my life. And so I just realized like that, that modeling helped me as I went forward in my life. That's interesting. Cause I don't, I'm just sitting and thinking, I don't think I had that same reassurance even though it probably came but that's not the message I took it was so there's always a bit of a sense of will will I be okay I know absolutely in later years that yes but growing up I think there was worry for me because I didn't have that reassurance um and no fault of anybody you know this no. is in the 70s I don't place fault anywhere it just is the you know what I needed to learn and navigate and things. So that's that's interesting, isn't it? How that plays out in life. Yeah. Those um, you know, it might just be a you know a, a, a word or a something that somebody says. And do you know what, Arlene? Through these podcasts, I've had feedback from people going, "Oh my gosh, your guest just said this one thing that really got me to think about things differently." Like we don't plan these podcast chats, we don't plan them, but the pearls of wisdom come out and people who need to hear what they need to hear will hear that. And that's yeah. really my, you know, my purpose of just finding out how people do life. And there will be, you know, I'm sure there will be people that will absolutely resonate with that, that, that it will be about just trust, allow, you know, everything will be okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, and kind of like what you were saying too, it's like use every experience to teach you something. You might not understand why it's happening in the yeah. moment, but 
essentially it's for you. Yes. And yes. why it's for you will be revealed if yes. you look for it. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I I can see um, I did a really nice exercise, which was just about um, I'm just trying to think the process. It was about um, it was in relation to business, but looking at what my story is and where the sort of pivotal points in my life have led me to where I am. That was a really cathartic exercise. I mean, I got some really good points out of it for, you know, obviously marketing and things like that. But it was a really cathartic exercise to be able to say, well, who am I and what has led me to where I am now? And there were some things, I Eileen, that weren't as conscious um, before I had gone through that activity. So for me, it was I became the secretary. You know, we talked about teach, women being teachers, nurses, secretaries are the main um, careers. Mine was a secretariat. I hated every single minute. I was not good at it. I had attitude. And then an opportunity came up for me to teach people to type. And that just opened up. It was, it just was like, oh my God, this is, this is, I love it. I'm good at it. And then that opened up other opportunities that sort of led me um, through my career. So I know that me being a secretary um, was part, it was not about me being a secretary. It was about me being in that position where I would then um, teach people. Right. Um, Somebody recognized your leadership. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then that everything leapt from there. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So it was interesting just kind of, um, I hadn't sort of put those pieces together before I'd um, written the, written out my whole, you know, story and stuff. It's, it's nice. It was a very, it was a very, like I said, cathartic and peaceful process to do that. A lot of healing came from that as well. Yeah, a lot of healing. Um, it's beautiful. It's so beautiful. you moved to Santa Barbara and do you think you'll stay there now? Is Santa Barbara your place to oh, be? Oh, I, I, until something else until I get told something else, but uh, so far it's been, um, I moved here in 1993. So next year will be 30 years. Yep. Yeah. So um, kind of one of what we say as locals is we live in paradise. We know we live in paradise and we want to keep it paradise. Yes. So yes. I don't anticipate leaving anytime soon. Yeah, nice. That's beautiful. Any last pearls of wisdom? So any bits of advice or um, for others? Actually, let me reframe that. What do you, what's maybe the best piece of advice that you've been given? And I know you've already shared a lot, but is there anything that pops to mind about best piece of advice you've been given in life? Um. There's two phrases that come to mind. One is um, this too shall pass. Yes. yes. So whether it's joyful things, enjoy them. That's going to pass. Like change yes. is the constant. Yes. So get used to that rather than holding on. So there's that. And, um, and the other phrase that came to me was be still and know. Oh, I love that. This too shall pass so that we're not going to be stuck wherever we are, but it's also about not taking for granted when we are in a good place. And what was the second one? Be still. Be, be still and know. It's it's be kind of biblical. Be still and know I am God. But just yeah. be still and know. No. Yeah. Because if you are still and you tune into your inner guidance and you listen to your heart, you will know. Yes. Arlene, I think that is absolutely beautiful. I work um, coaching with a lot of clients and often when I ask a question, a very quick response comes, I don't know. And it's like, but if you did know, and then it's like, well, I don't know. And what I get them to do is just to sit with that and just to listen, be still. Because when they go inside, it's about, I think, helping people to know that they have the answers within them. And it's about accessing those answers within them. And it is about being still, asking questions. You might not get it straight away, but it's about being 
um, in that space where you can allow that inner guidance to, to come. Yeah, and it takes us back to the trust piece. Yes, it absolutely you know, does. Trust and patience. Um, and also, I love what you're saying about how you coach because it's it's always the mind in service to the heart. Yes. When people don't know, it's the brain, but the heart knows. The heart always knows. The heart always knows. The heart yeah. always knows. And I, I think one of the things that I've um, had challenges with and still have challenges with is getting out of the the mind into the heart. Sometimes I'm a lot up here and, you know, that masculine energy, what needs to be done, let's make it happen. But it's about moving into the heart and what is the inner knowing and that feminine energy as well. Oh, my gosh. Lovely, lovely, Arlene. I have just loved this. So thank you very much for your time and, um and if people do want to get in contact with you, we've got the details in the show notes. So thank you. Um, thank you so much. Well, thank you. This has been really wonderful. And I just also love that we're across the continent, yes. you know, yeah. that we probably 6,000 miles, we're halfway around the world. And yet here we are present in loving with one another. So it's Absolutely. just wonderful. It's beautiful. Thank you, Arlene. Thank you, Catherine. Bye-bye. Bye.